Good afternoon. Thank you for choosing Premier Christian Radio. Whether you're listening live this Saturday on the first Saturday of 2009 or you're listening online via podcast, however you've joined me, you're very welcome along to Unbelievable, the programme that gets Christian and non-Christians talking. Well, thanks to those who have gone before me. And don't forget, Hip Rock UK is here between four and six o'clock this afternoon on Premier Christian Radio. This is the programme, as I say, that gets Christians talking to non-Christians and we've got uh, some pretty top guests for you today. Let me tell you what's coming up. You're unbelievable. Well, we're going to be meeting shortly Bart Ehrman. Uh, Bart has made a name for himself in the US for his best-selling book, Misquoting Jesus. And the subtitle to that is How and Why the New Testament Has Been Changed. Uh, his contention is that we no longer have the original copies of the New Testament documents. All we have are copies of copies of copies, in fact many of which are hundreds of years after the first copies were made. So um, does this present a problem for Christians? What about the fact that there have been changes, uh, deliberate or um, errors? Uh, uh, What do we do about this? We've got Christian Peter Williams from Tyndale House in Cambridge. He himself is a New Testament and Old Testament expert. He's going to be filling us in on what he thinks about the Bible and the fact that we can trust the New Testament as we've received it. Yes, Bart's book, Misquoting Jesus, has been published here in the UK just recently under the title, Whose Word Is It? So uh, if you're looking for it on bookshelves in the UK, that's the title you're looking for. But uh, most known in the US as the title, Misquoting Jesus. Um, And uh, we're going to be getting into that conversation shortly with Bart, who, as he'll explain, uh, part of the journey to him losing his Christian faith was his discovery that, in his estimation, the Bible couldn't be the uh, authoritative word of God since he came to the conclusion that he just wasn't convinced we have the words that were originally written down. Um, A fascinating book. I read it over the Christmas period and um, I think actually in some ways more of a challenge to Christians than many of these, uh, you know, uh, polemical books from Richard Dawkins, etc. So I'm looking forward to seeing how Peter Williams responds, our Christian on the programme today. Just quickly, uh, time to mention uh, thanks for getting in touch after the Virgin Birth show a couple of weeks ago. We heard a debate between Unitarian Sarah Tinker and Michael Saywood on the uh, literal or, if you like, fictional version of the virgin birth, which is true. Um, <clears throat> uh, had some interesting replies on the uh, topic that I've been that I posted up on the Premier Unbelievable group at the Premier Community online. Um, <clears throat> this one from Steve, who is an atheist, posting said, "When did James, the brother of Jesus, first begin to believe Jesus had been born of a virgin? And when did the disciples?" Disciples first learned that Jesus had been born of a virgin. And Brad, who's a a regular Christian poster on the uh, Unbelievable Forum, says, "Um, That's an interesting question, Steve. My theory would be that James and the disciples didn't know this until later. Uh, Matthew 1.19 says that Joseph was trying to avoid the stigma by keeping the pregnancy a secret. I can imagine Mary and Joseph not discussing this until later in life when Jesus' ministry was catching hold, like some parents hide the truth of a child's adoption. James would also easily be incredulous at this suggestion when he first found out. I don't think it became a clear teaching until the disciples interpreted Matthew 1.23 one twenty three as the prophetic announcement of his birth. If you want to listen back to that show on uh, the virgin birth fact or fiction, it's of course available as all our shows are at the unbelievable webpage. You can listen back there, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable uh, to listen back and to subscribe to the podcast as well. That is an option as well. Um, uh, thanks for getting in touch about that. Last week we uh, had an, a sort of end of year edition where I brought you some exclusive content speaking to people like Tom Wright, Bishop of Durham, um, Timothy Keller, author of The Reason for God, David Robertson of the Dawkins Letters. Uh, here's one person who enjoyed that programme. Hi Justin, uh, it's John ringing from South London today. First of all, Happy New Year to you. Wish you all the best, you and yours. And a great program today, really one of the best I've ever heard, including Dr. Tom Wright from last Easter. The Dawkins Letters by David Robertson, yes, thank the Lord, literally, that we've got people like him and uh, Timothy Keller, etc., and Tom Wright and the other guests. So I've got friends who are atheists, or they claim to be atheists, and some one of them doesn't believe in anything. And we've had a few run-ins on the telephone. Look forward to next week. All the best, and uh, bye. Take care. 
Thank you very much, John, for your comments on the programme. Glad you enjoyed it. I say one person who enjoyed it. I'm sure there were many people who enjoyed it. But uh, if you would like to enjoy that and you haven't had the chance or would like to let someone else know about it, again, go to the unbelievable webpage at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Well, doing things a little bit differently today, we're going to uh, hear from Father John Twistleton next week. Um, he's postponing his programme until next week, and we're just going to give as much time as we can to Bart Ehrman and Peter Williams for this very important and timely edition of Unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, welcome along to the programme, and uh, it's a really special one for me today. I've been looking forward to this for ages. Bart Ehrman joins us on the programme today. Bart is Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's the author of more than 20 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Misquoting Jesus, that's been published in the UK as Whose Word Is It? And uh, that's the book we're looking at in today's programme as we ask, Misquoting Jesus, do we have the original writings of the New Testament? And uh, here to debate with Bart on this is Peter Williams. Uh, he's the warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge, and he's uh, specialised in the translation of New and Old Testament documents and has published a number of academic books and articles on biblical scholarship. So we've got two extremely intelligent people in the studio with me today with uh, uh, qualifications as long as your arm. Uh, so uh, we're going to try and keep things, though, in a sense, to a level where as many people as possible can enjoy the discussion that we're going to be looking at today. And uh, it's it's a really interesting discussion. Over the Christmas period, I read Bart's book, um, uh, Misquoting Jesus, or as I say in the UK, Whose Word Is It? And very challenging. And um, I would say, actually, having read books by people like Dawkins and uh, Hitchens, etc., that, that in many ways, uh, Bart's book is, is more of a challenge to, uh, a Christian's faith because of it, the depth and the uh, scholarship that's involved. It's not a, a rhetorical sort of broadside against Christianity. This is uh, thought through, very well documented, researched, a lifetime really of academic research has gone into a book that uh, had an appeal to the mass market and I suppose that's what's made it such a, an interesting book to be looking at today. So welcome along to the programme, Bart. Great to have you with us. Great, thanks for having me. Um, so you come from the States, obviously uh, but uh, you're over here in the UK just for a little while um, because uh, you've got family here. So, so uh, have you enjoyed Christmas, first of all, in the UK? Very much, yes. We, uh, we travel around to different parts of the family, so it's almost literally the 12 days of Christmas for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting, I suppose. Um, you must see quite a difference between the way we do it here in the States, or, or, or is it broadly the same? Uh, it's, it's very much the same. A lot of commercialism. <laughs> I'm afraid that's true, probably, of, uh, of most places now, uh, that, that Christmas is turning into that kind of a thing. Um, you yourself uh, are not a Christian, but you once were, and in many ways the book, uh, Misquoting Jesus, is uh, in partly uh, an autobiographical sketch of how you started out with a certain view of the Bible and a very strong Christian faith, but you came to lose that. So tell us a little bit about that and, and what happened. Right. Well, I, I, I would say that the, the book is about my starting out as a, as a strong evangelical Christian uh, and about my moving away from it. I, I don't think the book is about my uh, losing the faith uh, because the views that I ended up with uh, after doing my research on the New Testament uh, that I deal with in this particular book uh, didn't lead me away from Christianity. I was still a Christian when mm -hmm. I came to these views. Uh, but I started out uh, I started out as a Christian as, uh, as an Episcopalian, so the, the American version of, of uh, Anglican, and uh, grew up that way uh, through my childhood. But then when I was in high school, I had a born-again experience, uh, uh, which uh, was a common phenomenon back in the 1970s when this happened. Uh, uh, I committed my life to Christ and understood that I had had this, this new experience and became a very committed evangelical Christian. And uh, this was in high school. And after high school, then I went off to Moody Bible Institute, which is a more or less fundamentalist uh, Bible college, uh, training people like me uh, to uh, learn about the Bible and, and theology. And so uh, what happened uh, to start to plant doubts in your minds about how we 
reliable the, the, the Bible is in terms of the transmission of the New Testament? Well, for many years I was committed to the view that the Bible had no mistakes in it at all. Uh, at Moody, we were taught that the Bible is inerrant, uh, that there are no, uh, no problems with the Bible, no co- contradictions, no discrepancies, no historical mistakes, no scientific errors. That is completely, absolutely true. And so this is my view for many years. Uh, after Moody, I went off to do a degree in English at a place called Wheaton College, and then from there uh, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary to study with one of the great uh, New Testament scholars in the country, uh, a man named Bruce Metzger. Uh, and while I was at Princeton Seminary, I started having uh, doubts about my views about the inerrancy of the Bible. I started uh, taking uh, courses in biblical studies uh, with professors who thought that the Bible was not inerrant, that in fact it was a very human book. And I started seeing more and more of the human side uh, of the of the New Testament. I uh, started seeing uh, what appeared to me to be discrepancies, for example, or contradictions in the text. But at the same time, I uh, got very interested in the study of the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and this also contributed to my view that uh, that perhaps the New Testament was not without error, or the Bible was not without error. Uh, the uh, the reality is that uh, we don't have the originals of any of the books of the New Testament. Uh, the, the same can be said of, of the Old Testament as well, but I was focusing at the time on the New Testament. Uh, we don't have the original copies that, uh, that Mark or Matthew produced or that Paul wrote. Uh, what we have are copies that were made later by scribes who were copying down the words of these, of these authors. Uh, we have thousands of these copies of the New Testament, but uh, none of them is is, uh, is exactly like any of the others, so that uh, all of them have been changed in one way or another. Uh, and this this perplexed me at the time, because if uh, if my belief was right, that, the, that, that God had inspired the very words of the Bible, uh, how is it that we don't have the words of the Bible, that uh, there are places where we don't know what the words were? If God wanted us to have his words, why don't we, ha- why don't we have his words? Uh, and so this became a source of uh, confusion for me for, for a while. And this must have been a, a disturbing thing. I mean, you, you sort of can spell it out in a few words now, but, but at the time it, it shook your faith in the way you understood your faith radically. Uh, very much so. My, my faith, uh, unlike the faith of many people that I know now, my faith at that time was based on the view that the Bible is the absolute bedrock of, of what we believe, that it's a blueprint for our lives. It tells us exactly how we should live. It tells us exactly what's going to happen in our future uh, when the end of time comes. It tells us exactly what we have to believe and exactly what we have to know in order to be saved. And the very words themselves really matter, that God has communicated to us in his words. So that was my belief. Uh, And as I started doubting that we actually had the the original words, it made me wonder about very deep uh, and and personal issues. How can I know how to live if I don't have God's words telling me? How do I know what to believe? How do I know what's going to happen in our future? If, in fact, we don't have the originals of the New Testament, how do we, how do we know what God has communicated to us? Well, eventually, that, that course would eventually lead you not to abandon your faith. That, that, in a sense, came later, and we'll look a bit more at that next week when we have you back on to talk about your latest book, God's Problem and the Problem of Suffering in the Bible, which was more, if you like, put the lid on your deconversion, let's say. But um, at the very least, it certainly changed your view of Scripture and the idea that the Bible was God's Word. You saw it, as you say, you came to see it as a, as a very human book. We'll come back to misquoting Jesus specifically in a moment, but let's first of all turn to our other guest for today, Peter Williams. As I say, uh, Peter is the warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge. He is a Christian. Um, Peter, you've obviously spent many years as well studying New Testament texts, Old Testament texts as well. Um, we'll find out maybe how your interpretations and the conclusions you've arrived at have, have been somewhat different from Bart's. But tell us a little bit about your early life. Uh, was, has Christianity been a part of your life uh, from, from an early age? Yes. Well, it's great to be here. I'd say I was brought up in a devout Christian family with a, uh, uh, an environment where people read a lot. My parents read a lot, and they also read the Bible to us. And it was always um, a benchmark, the benchmark of um, authority, uh, for us, although it was understood that the translations uh, we used um, were not the actual benchmark, but the Bible in its original languages. In fact, my father could read the New Testament in Greek since he'd learnt 
uh, Greek at school. Wow. And I had the privilege of going to one of those very few state schools <laughs> where you could still learn Greek. In fact, right. the headmaster said, if there's even one person in the school who wants to learn Greek, then uh, we'll put it on. Uh, actually, there were two or three. And so I ended up doing a lot of Greek and Latin at school, becoming interested in wanting to read the originals for myself and then actually going to university to Cambridge to study classics, Greek and Latin, uh, followed by Hebrew and Aramaic. So that was my mm. my beginning. Well, one really. thing that interested me in, when I was reading Bart's book was a, a, a quote you said, perhaps from someone else, uh, that reading the Bible in translation is like reading it in black and white. Reading it in the original Greek is like reading it in full colour. I mean, is that something you would you would agree with in some way? Well, Peter? obviously, any metaphor like that could, <laughs> could be could be misleading. I mean, certainly there are many nuances, links which come out in the original uh, in terms of uh, catch words. Uh, the way ideas are structured, which are clearer in the original language. I would say the best analogy is just looking at other translations. We, we read all sorts of works in translation, uh, works of literature and, and so on, and we're used to that. And I don't see the Bible as being particularly different as a mm. translation from those sorts of works. OK. So uh, you, your studies, um, did they have the same effect on you and your Christian faith as, as they had on Bach? Were, were, were you challenged and, and did your faith kind of take a bit of a, a battering in any way when you came to see uh, some of the issues involved with, with the way scripture has been passed down? Well in one way yes and in another way no. If I can just explain um, certainly when you're brought up in a Christian environment and then you go to study the Bible uh, critically in a university and you learn various viewpoints uh, you get to look at things from an angle you've never seen before and you engage with thought systems which are rather different from the way you do. And uh, certainly that led me to questioning and, and, and doubt as well. However, the way that resolved itself was, uh, in, in fact, over time to a, a stronger position of uh, faith. So, uh, in, in fact, the uh, conviction of the absolute um, authority of Scripture that I entered is also something that I continue to hold. And in one sense, it's also strengthened as time goes by and you realize that at least in your extremely uh, narrow area, you uh, know more than anyone else, uh, that uh, gives you comfort that what you're working with works with what you know uh, more than anyone else about. Um, of course, someone may always challenge you from their speciality and they may uh, be able to put things in a way that you can't answer. But that's the, just the nature of academic dialogue. Sure. Um, and so... What do you stand on now, as it were? For Bart, his uh, studies and his research led to a complete abandonment of the idea that the, the word of God was divine, was in some way authoritative. And we've used the word already inerrant. Now, it depends, I think, to some extent, different people may have different understandings of what that means. But, but what, what would you, if you were trying to encapsulate how you view the Bible now, what what is your belief about the, the New Testament specifically? Well, I believe that uh, the New Testament, but I'd also say this for the old, uh, is uh, the word of God. Um, Bart's position is that we don't have uh, the original writings of the New Testament. I would say that we do. We don't have the original copies, but we do have the original uh, writings. And uh, certainly uh, it's not necessary to have the original uh, writings uh, in Greek in that it would be perfectly uh, possible to... Uh, accept the authority of scripture and not believe you had access to it in the original languages. Uh, the reformers at the time of the Reformation uh, believed that the Bible had been authoritative in the Middle Ages, even though people hadn't had access uh, to it in its original languages. So that's not a necessary um, thing. Uh, so I think that the Bible is true. I'm happy with the word inerrant. I, I don't uh, um, use Bart's gloss um, of saying that that means no problems uh, in, in, in the Bible, um, there are plenty of things that uh, we can struggle to understand. Basically, by that I mean true um, in a normal sense. Mm. Okay, true. And so you, you, when you say you do believe the Bible is inerrant, I mean, do, do you mean by that that we have a true uh, sort of, if you like, handing down of, of what was originally written and that the if you like, there may be things that obviously need interpretation and understanding in the context of the time, which, if you like, some people like try to make out, and perhaps this was true of your early life, Bart as a Christian, 
to make everything match perfectly in the Bible with a modern scientific understanding, for instance, of the way the world works. And, and that can be difficult because obviously people at another time lived when they understood things in different ways. I mean, in what sense is the Bible inerrant in, in that way for you? Well, uh, the, the way I would uh, use the word, firstly, is it um, tangentially, attach, tangentially attaches to the Bible, uh, essentially because... Uh, because of God's character. So it's it's derived from the fact that uh, God uh, speaks truly and that uh, the Bible is his speech. So it's si- essentially that syllogism mm. um, uh, that, that gives you uh, the idea of inerrancy. That does not mean that you can prove uh, inerrancy. Um, of course, someone might seek to disprove it, um, and, and that's uh, fine. What I would say then is it's it's a very broad uh, doctrine of of the truth of Scripture. Now, of course, people I think through history have always made a distinction uh, between the actual copy they have in front of them and that about which they um, uh, formulate doctrines of Scripture. So, for instance, you, you'll find this with um, uh, Calvin or Luther when uh, they're writing, they uh, accept that the copy, the edition, the printed edition or the manuscript they may have uh, may have, well, will have uh, printing errors and, and other sorts of errors that have come in that they distinguish from uh, that to which they as- describe ascribe authority. I mean, I think it's a bit like I, I have two children and we read them Bible stories and they seem to know that uh, the big adult Bible is in some sense a more authoritative document than the lovely mm picture things that they um, receive and and I think um, people have always made that distinction of course there's always a failure to make that distinction Mm. because when people read the Bible in translation with time often people begin to forget that it's a translation and I think that's the King James version was good enough for Paul it's it's good enough people need to be reminded Uh, that that's not the way the Christian doctrine works. Well, we will give Bart a chance to come back on some of these things as as we go on. But, um, I mean, misquoting Jesus in the States has been a huge success, Bart. I mean, why do you think people have been so turned on to this particular book and and what it has to say about your beliefs that we we don't have any way of accessing the original documents or or knowing that what we have is, is a true representation of them? Yeah, well, you know, when I wrote the book, I wasn't sure that anybody would want to read it. I mean, it's about it's a book about Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that would be on the New York <laughs> Times bestseller list or anything. But uh, as it turns out, um, this is a subject that most people don't know anything about. They they never heard of before. Uh, and uh, – People just assume when they buy a Bible that they're reading they're reading the words that were written. Of course, it's in a translation, but uh, basically the, the stories you read in the Bible are the stories that were originally in the Bible. And people have no idea that we not only don't have the original copies, say, of Paul's letter to the Galatians, we don't have a copy uh, of – a copy of that the original, or a copy of the copy of the original, or a copy of the copy of the copy of the original. We don't have a copy of this manuscript for for probably about 150 years after Paul had died, and so uh, and and we don't have full manuscripts of the entire Bible until the end of the fourth century, 300 years after these books were written. People didn't realize that in fact uh, there was there were so many stages in the in the history of the transmission, and that at every stage things were being changed. Uh, and I think this was news to people. And, and it just sort of struck a nerve. Mm. Well, well, we'll come to that in a bit more detail and allow you to kind of, if you like, put out the theses, the main yeah. sort of points that you make in the book in the next section of the programme. But So that's uh, the start of this programme as we look at this question of uh, do we have the original writings of the New Testament? And uh, what difference does it make, the fact that there have been changes, um, that over time errors have crept in, etc.? Um, how reliable are the documents we have and the translations we have of these documents? Uh, and and what impact does that have on the Christian faith? Well, two people with, if you like, different conclusions, but both uh, with a vast uh, amount of scholarly uh, work and um, uh, research behind them. Bart Ehrman and Peter Williams joining me on the programme today to talk about this very important issue. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio.
Welcome back. And we're talking about misquoting Jesus. It uh, was the New York, New York Times bestseller from Bart Ehrman uh, in recently. Do we have the original writings of the New Testament is the question we're asking. Uh, Bart's book has provoked a whole storm of uh, controversy uh, as he made really for the general public available what has been available to, for New Testament scholars for a long time, just the facts about the transmission of the Bible. And uh, Bart's thesis is that we simply can't get back to the originals in the way they were really written. We, we can to some extent, but not fully. And many people don't realise that about the Bible. That's, that's what Bart suggests in this book. Uh, and uh, it draws on all kinds of evidence for that. Uh, we've got Peter Williams also with us in the studio. Peter is a Christian. He's the warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge. Uh, who, he specialised for a long time in the translation of New and Old Testament documents. So he's, uh, if you like, our uh, voice of authority on the Christian side of this particular debate. And he believes that um, despite all of what Bart says in the book, and much of which he agrees with, we can still have um, a faith in the Bible and that it uh, does give us, if you like, um, the intention and the words that were originally uh, purported by the original authors. So let's talk about this. Um, and I think we've got to start, Bart, with um, just, if you like, in a nutshell, as briefly as possible, though, of course, these things are not that easy to, to condense. Um, the main points you want to, to, to make in misquoting Jesus, or uh, as we have it in the UK, whose word is it. Um, so tell us a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, my my uh, my main points, I guess, could be could be summarized uh, f- from through a through a series of statements. Uh, we don't have the original copies of any of the books of the New Testament. What we have are uh, copies that were made much later, in most cases, many centuries later. These copies all differ from one another. No two of them uh, are exactly alike, which means scribes were changing the text. Uh, we don't know how many changes they made in the text. We have we have over 5,000 manuscripts just in the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written. In these over 5,000 copies, there are hundreds of thousands of differences. As I often put it to my students, uh, there are more differences in these manuscripts that we have than there are words in the New Testament. So we're talking about extensive variation. Most of these differences don't matter for anything. Uh, The majority of them probably do nothing more than show us that scribes in the ancient world can spell no better than my students can today. And indeed, some of them probably don't even make a difference when it comes out in the translation of the English, the word order in the Greek. Many many of them may not not even come out in any way. Many of them you can't translate at all. They they simply make no difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But there are some differences that make, make a difference, and some Sometimes they make a lot of difference. Sometimes uh, these changes affect how a passage is to be interpreted. Sometimes they affect the meaning of an, t- an entire book. Sometimes they affect uh, the uh, the area of Christian doctrine. They'll, they'll involve some aspect of Christian theology. Uh, and it's these big changes, uh, the one, are the, which are the ones that I focus on mm. mainly in my book, uh, to show people just how significant some of these problems can be. I mean, what fascinates me is when you take in the book the, the reader through the process that was employed, you know, and the fact that obviously in today's age we're used to sending a document to a printer and printing out 100 copies, you know, and we expect every document obviously to be exactly the same as each other. But obviously at the time the New Testament documents were written, everything was written out by hand. And so you had to trust in the ability of the scribe, as it were, the person copying a letter or a document their ability to do that, um, you know, in, in a sense, correctly. Uh, but And they would have been as susceptible to mistakes and just lapses of judgment and error, etc., as, as we are today. Uh, I mean, if you ask someone to um, write something down for you in a telephone message or something, and you went and looked at it later, you might find, you know, it, it's somewhat different to what right. to what they might said. They might give the wrong telephone number. They might miss a digit or something. But uh, it's an even bigger problem when you're copying out entire books. Uh, if my students have trouble believing this. I tell them just copy down Matthew sometime and see how well you do. Uh, and it's, and people will make different mistakes. And the problem is with, with the scribal culture, uh, it's not like reproducing a, 100,000 copies of the book where every letter is the same. One copyist makes uh, a copy and makes mistakes. The next copyist who copies his copy reproduces his mistakes often because he thinks those are the original words. And and because of this, one of the main tenets of um, your particular academic exercise is to try and find the very earliest copies, if you like, because those will hopefully give us 
the most accurate representation of what the original document said. So if we have a letter from Paul, we're looking for a copy that came as early as possible and, and because that will be closest to the original because later copies will have probably more changes or errors or whatever it may be. That's right. So if Paul wrote, say Paul writes a letter in the year 50, uh, you would love to have a copy from the year 50 or from the year 51 or the year 52. But unfortunately, we don't have a copy until, say, the year 200, 150 years later. And we don't have a complete set of Paul's letters until the uh, about three, 350. So we're talking hundreds of years of copying in which scribes are not only making their own mistakes, but reproducing the mistakes of their predecessors. And so there are, there's this enormous gap between when Paul wrote and our earliest copies of his letters. Well, we'll come to some of the specific examples as, as we go. Um, but Peter, I mean, is your view of this the same as Bart's, that, that there is um, really a, an awful lot of time in which stuff could have changed just in the natural course of making copies and then copies of those being made and copies of those being made. Uh, and the fact that for many documents in the New Testament, there has elapsed a couple of centuries before we have, if you like, the first copies available to us. Well, in one sense, uh, our views are the same in the sense that we will have exactly the same, um, well, roughly the same dates of documents uh, uh, from the time of uh, writing of a New Testament book to its early, earliest uh, copy. However, um, I think I would tend to see the glass as half full, whereas Bart would see it as half empty. Uh, in, in fact, obviously, the gap that there is between the earliest copy of a New Testament writing and uh, when it was written uh, is less uh, for most New Testament texts than it is for class, uh, classical writings. Um, and so, really, I, I see this as a matter of, of, of presentation. Um, I think Bart tends to focus rhetorically on the negative and on the issue of how much things change, uh, whereas he doesn't focus the same amount on how much they stay the same, uh, despite uh, copying. So, so, so what you're saying is, rather than say, look how much it's changed, you would say, well, look how remarkably similar these are. Rather well, than... in one sense, I, I would say focus on both. What I think uh, Bart would tend to do is to actually dramatise um, uh, change. So when we have, for instance, talk about there being hundreds of thousands of differences in New Testament manuscripts, and that's more than there are words in the New Testament, I'd say, well, that's one of those fairly useless statistics. It's a bit like me saying, well, there are maybe a couple of million sides of New Testament manuscript. We've only got hundreds of thousands of differences in a couple of million sides of manuscript, each of which may have hundreds of letters on, and therefore, you know, uh, there aren't many um, specific errors per page. Isn't this remarkably well copied? Well, I won't use that argument, but it's the sort of thing that one uh, can do, and I'm not sure it gets us uh, very far. Uh, we're both agreed that a large number of these differences uh, can be shown to be secondary. So the question really is how many uh, are variants are there in the manuscripts which might seriously contend for being the original? How much uncertainty is there at that level? Um, I don't know that anyone's uh, really made a, a proper study of that. And to some extent, the level of uncertainty you think there is about the New Testament text uh, comes from the method you adopt to establish the New Testament text. So, uh, but I, I don't think that the um, uncertainty is uh, anything like so great. And as I said earlier, even if we were to lose all of the uh, Greek copies uh, that there are of the New Testament, I think we'd still have uh, tolerably good access uh, to uh, the original via translation. If I could just say uh, one more thing, that's that I think sometimes there can be a method which says, well, we've got so many differences in the manuscripts that makes a strength of the transmission of the New Testament, namely the number of manuscripts, into a weakness. Because if you had double the number of manuscripts, you'd have even more differences. Mm. And so, in a sense, the stronger the evidence for the New Testament becomes, uh, the more you could make um, an argument that isn't there uncertainty because there are so many variants. So I, I just think we need to avoid that sort of uh, way of, of reasoning. I mean, we'll come later on in the programme to maybe some of the 
questions that arise from the whole fact that there are variants and, and you know, because I think for many people that, that starts the question in their mind if they are a Christian, well, why would God have allowed, you know, th- this process to take place in the first place if this is God's word, shouldn't it have been kept, you know, wouldn't God be able to, to keep it as God's word without all these errors creeping in and whatever. But but we'll, we'll maybe come to that later. For, I mean, for the moment, we've talked in general terms about these uh, variations that exist. And as you've said, Bard, probably the vast majority, I assume, don't actually make any particular difference to the way we would interpret a, a document. Um, they, they may be spelling mistakes, they may be word order changes. They, they're things that can be ironed out, if you like, fairly easily. But there is a small minority where you believe there are significant changes that have been made either through error or through purposeful addition or subtraction to the text. So um, there's a couple that you particularly focus on in the book. Um, Perhaps we could start with the the segment of the book that you title Mark and an Angry Jesus and tell us what it is that you've outlined in this particular section of the book. Yeah, this is a, it's a, I think a particularly interesting example because it involves just a single word uh, in a in a story in the Gospel of Mark. the The story is when uh, a uh, a leper approaches Jesus, uh, has leprosy, and he asks Jesus if he's willing to cleanse him. And the uh, the text says that uh, the man says, "If you're willing, uh, you're able to make me clean." And Jesus, uh, it says, feeling compassion for the man, uh, says, "I am willing." He reaches out his hand touches him, and he cleanses him of his leprosy. Uh, And so it's a very powerful and moving story. What's striking is that in one of our oldest Greek manuscripts, uh, and in a couple of of other uh, witnesses, uh, the text does not say that Jesus felt compassion and reached out his hand and touched him. The word is changed. Uh, In in these witnesses, instead it says, Jesus getting angry reached out his hand and touched him, said, I'm willing, and he, and he cleansed him. Uh, so it's a, it's a difference between just one word. Uh, the, the Greek word, asplonknistes, which means feeling compassion, or the Greek word, orgistes, which means getting angry. And so it makes a pretty big difference whether mm. Jesus is feeling compassion or, or, or getting angry. Yeah, it, it's not as though it's just the difference between being compassionate and showing mercy or some kind of yes. small variation. It's literally two very different emotions. Uh, I, I understand these to be very different emotions. If uh, if, if if my wife feels compassion for me, I know that's very different from her being angry with me. Uh, okay, so so you're saying we can't know which was originally written by Mark? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm. Uh, I actually think we can know uh, I, with relative certainty. Okay. Uh, I think every historical judgment is a probability judgment. And so uh, the thing is, w- what I think we can know is that originally the text said that Jesus got angry mm-hmm. uh, and that it, you don't find this in most English translations. Okay. So, but, so if, if someone turns to their Bible right now and looks up that passage in Mark, what was the passage again? Mark, it's Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. I'm just looking it up in my, my New Revised Standard Version. And uh, as you say, yes, it says... Um, here we go. Oh, uh, uh, moved with pity. So moved compassion. With pity. Yes. And now, admittedly, the, the NRSV does have a little side note to say other ancient authorities read anger. Yes. So good it's, to it's them. quite a scholarly sort of edition, obviously, yes. of the NRSV. But nonetheless, it just goes to show that there's quite a difference between those two interpretations or those two readings, if you like. So, I, I so, see that as a difference. I know some scholars want to say that they aren't, they aren't very different from one another, but uh, I think anger I, and I mean, does this and, yes. and you make the argument in the book that, that this fits better as well with Mark overall as, as a book. Yeah, that's right. I mean, see, what, one of the reasons for thinking that originally said he got angry is because you have to imagine scribes copying this text. Is a scribe who comes across the statement that Jesus felt compassion likely to change it to he became angry? Or, on the other hand, is a scribe who came across a text that said he got angry wonder about that and likely to change it he felt compassion. It went one way or the other. So you believe the manuscripts that read got, uh, felt compassion, at some point a scribe made a change, a deliberate change, changed angry to compassion. That's right. Effectively. And so the, 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 the documents we have today that speak of Jesus becoming compassionate towards this leper are in fact 
uh, not the original. This was a change that was made deliberately by a scribe at some point. But, and so we have a, effectively an error in our Bible. This is not what was originally written. Uh, that's my view, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. They, what, what's your response to that then, Peter? Well, firstly, I agree absolutely uh, with Bart that it matters uh, which of these two uh, is uh, the original reading, uh, whether it's compassion or anger. And I think it makes a significant difference to how you understand the passage. Um, Bart's argument also that it makes a significant difference to how you understand the presentation of Jesus in the whole book, I think, is exaggerated because I think even if you do read uh, being angry, that wouldn't be read as being irrationally uh, angry. Uh, it would be, in some sense, a justifiable anger. But I think, actually, uh, the relative certainty that he has about this being uh, the original reading, that anger is the original reading, I, I think is unwarranted. And one of the things I'm interested uh, that he doesn't explore in his book is just the possibility that one word has changed into another by accident. When you consider these two Greek words, um, having compassion and, and um, being angry, they begin with the same letter shape. One, having compassion, begins with an S, which really looks like a capital C. Uh, one uh, begins with an O. So they begin with the same letter shape. They end with the same six letters. And in the middle, they also share a letter, uh, a, a, a G, which is a bit like an upside down L. So they've got a lot of visual similarity uh, between them. Now, we know that all sorts of things can go on uh, when uh, some, someone copies, and it could be through a one or two stage uh, process that one word gets changed into the other. What I would do is I would also note that it's only in one Greek Latin bilingual manuscript, so with Greek on one side and Latin on facing page, um, and uh, in three Latin witnesses and, and a bit more. But it's ten. It's got a fairly restricted. Um, this is the focus. use of the word anger. The use of the word it, anger. It only it's turns not, up in these restricted sort of manuscripts. As far it as doesn't have a broad um, distribution geographically. Um, uh, it, it's it's not found um, in Egyptian texts and so on. So. Uh, I, I would say that combined with the possibility that it can occur accidentally means that I wouldn't want to um, embrace um, with relative certainty the view that anger uh, there w was original. And I, I think that the uh, English translations have, have gone um, with what on present evidence is, is the better reading. Yeah, well, uh, in response to that, uh, I must say uh, Pete, Pete sounds very effective in his counter-argument. So, uh, yes, uh, 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 two things. One is... Um you know, a lot of scholars have looked at this problem, and, and different scholars line up on different sides of it. Um, I I think it's pretty unusual for a scholar to think that this was changed by accident because the words look alike. Uh, they're different lengths, and if you actually look at them in Greek, they don't look very they don't look that much alike. Uh, most people think that there's something else going on on with this text um, that somebody's changing it for some reason or another. The the, the one point that Pete doesn't bring up is that we uh, we know that um, this text of Mark was also used by both Matthew and Luke. Uh, so this gets a little bit complicated, but mm. but mo most scholars think that Mark was the source for many of the stories found in Matthew and Luke. And Matthew and Luke both have this story. And so you could look to Matthew and Luke to see which word they used. Do they see that, say that Jesus got angry, or do they say that Jesus felt com uh, felt compassion? Because if they uh, if they copied this text from Mark, uh, the, then whatever word they used was probably in their text of Mark. What's striking is that Matthew Matthew and Luke uh, don't use either word. Uh, they don't say anything about whether Jesus was angry or compassionate. And that's usually taken by scholars to indicate that there was something about what Mark said about Jesus at that point that they, didn't, uh, they couldn't understand or didn't like, and which makes it more likely that uh, Mark originally said that he got angry and Matthew and Luke both independently changed it. One thing that contributes to that is that Jesus gets angry on a couple of other occasions in Mark, and on these other occasions, Matthew and Luke eliminate the emotion altogether. I suppose at the same time, though, if there aren't issues over those other instances in which Jesus gets angry, um, the people who were copying it, or the same scholar who you would, uh, the same copyist who you say did change the first is in instance of angry, 
didn't then go and change the other ones as yes. well. You might have thought he would have done that just you, for the sake of you know continuity. Yes, but. you would, except for in the other instances, you can understand why he gets angry uh, because there's something going on. That the, In this instance, this, this poor leper comes up and wants to be healed, mm-hmm. <laughs> and Jesus gets angry. And so uh, you, you, might, you might be able to come up with an interpretation that explains why he got angry. In fact, I have my own interpretation of it. Mm-hmm. I, I think mm-hmm. I understand why he gets angry in this. But on first reading, most people think this sounds very peculiar indeed. I mean, this is just a sick man who wants to get healed, and Jesus gets angry. So it, it isn't justified the way it is in the other instances in Mark's mm. gospel. But but even so, on balance, you you personally go for the compassion reading. I mean, ultimately, the fact that there exists two different people in front of me, both who know far more about the, the text than I ever possibly could, and have diff- come to different conclusions. I mean, is is that in itself a worrying thing, that, that it could say this or it could say the other, Peter? Well, obviously, I think uh, it would be nice to have everything of this sort nailed down. So, uh, yes, it's something that uh, Christians should be concerned to um, establish I- exactly what the... Um, uh, original wording of the New Testament is. Uh, at the same time, I, I would st- um, perhaps want to put, make my p- a position uh, stronger that I, I really think that um, anger is an outsider on this. Um, now, that doesn't mean there aren't many um, scholars who uh, wouldn't support uh, Barth's uh, eloquent arguments uh, in favour of being angry um, uh, in this case. I have a reserve, first a reservation, partly I think there's a problem uh, with Bart's method, that he consistently uh, prefers intelligent design arguments over chance when it comes to uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, really explanations other, uh, yeah. of, of um, things. So that when you have alternative explanations, and, and we know just how many sorts of um, errors can occur accidentally, and the unlikely words that can t- change into other words when you actually look at manuscripts and see how things change. Why would I introduce intelligent design, namely deliberate um, change at this point? Uh, I think at least you have to consider um, uh, fully uh, all the um, other arguments. Uh, in terms of his um, argument, and it's a very sophisticated argument, that uh, it's likely that someone changed anger into compassion because uh, Matthew and Luke uh, both omit uh, that word anger uh, in their parallel passages uh, narrating the same event. Um, it's it's uh, an interesting argument. Uh, I would say uh, there are a, a few steps in it. I mean, one of them involves um, the conclusion, uh, let's say, of 90% certainty that Matthew and Luke were using Mark, you then combine with that um, a sort of level of certainty of how much we can actually know about the way they're thinking as they are um, uh, changing um, uh, uh, words. And say, when I look at uh, Matthew's account of that, which might have something like 62 words as opposed to Mark's uh, 99, it's nearly three-fifths of the length. Now, why he might omit something? Mm. Um, I think there could be various uh, reasons. With Luke... um, I think uh, there are other signs of, of him emitting emotion language uh, from uh, from Mark. And, and so I think that uh, I, I think Luke did use Mark. And, and I think that could be explained, whether it's it's anger or compassion. I mean, we could probably to and fro with differing positions and inter- interpretations that for a long time. But I feel we must move on from this particular instance, though I accept, Bart, you could equally probably come back with all kinds of counter-arguments to that. Oh, I have dozens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean let, let it rest for the moment that, that there are obviously um, very strong arguments in both directions, and, and obviously, Bart, if you feel yours are the, the stronger, that's why you believe that the angry is the, the proper reading for, for this particular one. If you're listening and you'd like to get involved, I should just say you, you can get in contact and leave a, a voicemail message or, or an email and, and leave your thoughts on the discussion we've been having so far. I wonder, what's your view of the Bible? And um, have you read Bart's book? Um, Do you intend to read it? And and what's your uh, opinion on some of these uh, textual variations, if you like, between manuscripts? And and how far can we trust the Bible? I'd love to get your your opinions on this. Do email me unbelievable at premier.org.uk. That's the email address, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And if you'd like to phone in your comment, 08456 52 52 52 and select option five. 
Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. We've just coming to the end of this first part, and we've only managed to deal with one of the, the controversies in the book part, and I knew it would be like this. But, I mean, just before we move on to the next section, there are disputes over other passages that entail more than just a word. In fact, whole segments of text. I mean, I'm thinking what was a revelation to me when I read the book is that your, your contention that the, um, the, the story of the woman taken in adultery in the Gospel of John, is a later edition. It wasn't in the original writing of John. I mean, before we come to the next section, just as we finish this one, just just briefly outline for us why you believe that to be the yeah, case. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I, I don't know for sure. I imagine Pete will agree with me on this. That uh, He's nodding his head. So yes, yes, good. So uh, I... This is a this is people uh, scholars have known this for a very long time that this famous story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery wasn't originally in the fourth gospel. This is the passage where Jesus says, "Let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her." It's a it's a terrifically powerful and moving uh, passage, but it's not in any of our earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John. Uh, it it um, it doesn't have the same kind of writing style and vocabulary you find in the rest of John. It, it seems to interrupt the the flow of the stories in John. Uh, And so scholars have known for a very long time that this wasn't part of John's gospel, so much so that in most Bible translations today, uh, the story will appear in double brackets uh, with a footnote saying that uh, that, uh, most ancient authorities don't include the story. So uh, this would be an instance of a very, very uh, large and major change uh, in manuscripts in which scribes have apparently added a story that wasn't originally there. And does that make it less trustworthy as being a story that actually happened then, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, this is probably an apocryphal story about Jesus that uh, that some, some scribes had heard that maybe was f- floating around in the early church that possibly a scribe put in the margin of a manuscript because it seemed to illustrate some of the teachings of John chapter 7. And a later scribe took this marginal note and inserted it into the, into the text itself, and later scribes copied that manuscript. And so eventually it made it into the manuscripts that were used by the King James translators uh, so that it came into the English Bibles through, the, through, through, uh, through early English uh, Bible translations. Well, keep that thought, and if you're listening, um, we'll get a, a response. And Well, Peter has already uh, assented that you agree that it is a, an addition, as it were, but I'd just be interested to get Peter's thoughts on that whole area of what about passages which we can say ha- are an addition to the, to the text, weren't originally there. Um, that'll be in the next part of the programme. Um, uh, time is flying by and so much more that we could have covered so far in the programme, but we just don't get the time, uh, even though this is a, a reasonably generous sort of in, in radio terms, uh, uh, you know, portion of time in which to ascribe to these kinds of debates. But um, if you want to really get into it, you'll obviously have to get hold of Bart's book and uh, in some of the literature in response to it as well. Uh, In the UK, it's Whose Word Is It? The story behind who changed the New Testament and why, published by Continuum. And in the States, uh, Misquoting Jesus is the title of the book. We'll be back again in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to the program, a special edition with uh, Bart Ehrman. Uh, we're privileged to have him with us over from the States, uh, and uh, he's been talking to us about misquoting Jesus, uh, his best-selling book in the States on the story behind who changed the New Testament and why, available here in the UK as Whose Word Is It? Bart joins us again next week. We're going to be discussing his latest book, God's Problem. The subtitle for that one is How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. We're going to be joined on that program as well by uh, Richard Swinburne who is uh, an Oxford professor who's written extensively on the uh, philosophical aspect of the problem of evil and so uh, we're going to have a really interesting debate next week with Bart and Richard Swinburne. Do join us again at the same time between 2.30 and 4 o'clock for that and online at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio Back to our debate today, though, and uh, we're looking at uh, the book Misquoting Jesus and asking, do we have the original writings of the New Testament? Well, we've already heard from Peter Williams, who is our Christian in the studio today, that uh, in many ways he agrees with uh, 
to a certain degree, Bart's conclusions um, and his uh, research in terms of the manuscript variation. But uh, Peter, if you like, takes a more positive outlook on it. Uh, he says what we should be looking at more is just the way that we do have agreement between manuscripts as well as the disagreements, and that uh, we can get back to uh, an, uh, an original text. Uh, I think you'd say, Peter, that you've got more um, hope in the ability to do that than, than Bart appears to have. Is that, is that right? Uh, absolutely. In, in fact, I would be prepared to say that uh, I don't think it can be demonstrated that we've lost any of the original wording of the New Testament. However, you believe that in common with Bart that there have been additions, but we were just talking at the end of the last section uh, that the woman caught in adultery, Bart um, says, and most uh, scholars agree, that it's an addition to John's Gospel. It's not found in the earliest manuscripts of John's Gospel. And you agree with that as well. Now, what does that do then? Because for many people, that, that will be a bit of a, a revelation and, and a sort of, well, then we don't have what John originally wrote. We have something that's been added on by someone else who we've no idea who they are. Well, what I'd say is if you read uh, almost, well, the majority of modern uh, Bible translations, they will actually um, give indication showing that they don't think that's part of the original text. So it's so not I'm not like saying they're trying to cover it up or anything? New. No, it's, it's, uh, it's something uh, that's uh, widely known if you only uh, read uh, what's there. And what we're seeing is a pattern um, for um, Bible uh, translations uh, improving over, over time. So um, it, at the beginnings of printing and um, early on, uh, it wasn't always possible to print uh, the uh, best text. And, and what's, what's happening uh, through time is that there's opportunity to uh, print what is uh, uh, more reliable. And, and so actually, the, the differences are significant, but, but shouldn't uh, be exaggerated. And, and I think that if... Um, Bart Ehrman were to edit a Greek New Testament, I don't think it would differ more from uh, the recommended text of a modern Bible translation than that recommended text would differ from the King James. I mean, so I don't think the differences mm. are that big. I mean, if, if we're interested, though, in getting back to the original document that mm. was passed down, should this passage be in the Bible in the first place? Uh, because if we acknowledge it is an addition, I mean, should we, if in our efforts to get back to the original text, say, well, that passage shouldn't be there, take it out, you know, it was added probably, you know, however many years later? Well, I think that uh, Bible translators are, are being conservative towards a tradition of printing um, that text. And, and so even though on the whole they would say it, 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 it is secondary, uh, they are leaving it in its position uh, probably because they think that... Uh, their Bible sales would be badly hit if they took it out. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, there may be a place for them being a bit uh, bolder uh, about what they do. I mean, what about um, whether we can actually trust the story in the first place? I mean, do, do you see this as because it was obviously part of some tradition, uh, scribes felt strongly enough about it to insert it, that it, that it has some kind of value as a story, that, that uh, it has got a reasonable his, historical kind of... Well, there are, th th there's one issue of, as to its, its uh, moral value. The other issue is to do with its historical uh, value. And I think if it isn't um, something that can be uh, demonstrated to go back to early Christian testimony, then you can't have uh, the uh, same degree of certainty that you could have uh, as you could with something that uh, seems to go back to uh, the apostles and their associates. Okay. Let's look into another one, and inevitably we, we can sort of draw these out um, ad infinitum and we just don't have the space to do that, but we'll try and deal with this one reasonably quickly because I'd like to leave some space towards the end of this section to talk about where this leaves us, in, uh, uh, particularly for Christians who want to know, well, well, what do I believe then about the Bible, if you like? Um, but but uh, th there's another specific instance that you focus on in the book, Bart, Hebrews and a forsaken Jesus. Just to give us the details of, of what this particular variant is about. Right. So uh, this is, a, again, it's just a matter of a single word, uh, which uh, once more highlights the problem that, that e even if a scribe changes a word or a few letters of a word, it can have an enormous effect on what the text uh, means. In this case, uh, it's a passage in the, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9, where uh, the author is developing uh, an, an argument about Jesus, and, and he makes the comment that, uh, that Christ died by the grace of God. 
Um, but in uh, some manuscripts, instead of saying he died by the grace of God, uh, it says he died apart from God or away from God. Uh, they're very similar words. Uh, the Greek word for grace, karen, and the Greek word for apart from, chorus. They they kind of sound alike. They kind of look alike. They're, they uh, So, you know, it may be that somebody just, you know, just made a mistake and changed the word, but it makes a, a huge difference. I mean, did Jesus mm-hmm. die by God's grace or did he die apart from God? And what I argue in, in my book um, is that, uh, that well, what I point out is that there are a number of scholars over the last few decades decades who have thought that, in fact, originally this said just the opposite of what you would have expected. Uh, people are comfortable with the idea of saying Jesus died by the grace of God because it's by the grace of God that, that Christ's death brings salvation. But what would it mean to say that he died apart from God? And what I argue in my uh, in my book is that this is probably what the, originally it said. Uh, this isn't an, an, It's not an original argument on my part. This is an argument that scholars mm. have had for a while. The idea that the harder reading is the more likely one. In yeah, because because a scribe is more likely to take a reading that's hard to understand and make it something acceptable. I mean, when I first read that, my initial reaction was, well, it doesn't necessarily present some huge doctrinal problem for me as a Christian if if it's actually apart from God, because uh, there is a sense in which as part of our Christian theology is that Jesus was you know, separated from God at that moment yes. when the sin was placed upon him, etc. And so, right. so there is still a theological way of looking at this that doesn't present some kind of huge biblical problem for Christians. Absolutely. I'm not, and I'm not arguing at all that if, if the reading is originally apart from God, then therefore Christianity is false or something. <laughs> I, this isn't an argument that this isn't theologically uh, acceptable. I think that this is the view of the book of Hebrews, that Jesus died apart from God, meaning that he died apart from any divine solace that might have been his uh, as God's son. He died as a complete human being uh, without without any kind of supernatural help. But your contention is that it was changed deliberately by yes. a scribe at some point from apart from God to the grace of, grace by of the grace God. of God. And why would you think that that had been a deliberate change? Well, especially because when this change was made was apparently in uh, in the second century when there were Christians saying that that um, Jesus and the divine element within Jesus were two separate things, that the Christ in Jesus was a divine element who had come into the man Jesus temporarily, uh, and that so that Jesus wasn't himself the Son of God. Je- Jesus had the Christ within him. And they were using this verse to prove this, that he died apart from God, meaning that before he died, the divine element left him. This is a view of some of the Gnostic Christians of the second century. And so I think some scribes knew that the verse could be used in that way and afraid of this misuse, as they saw it, of the verse. They changed it by simply changing a couple letters so that now it doesn't say that he died uh, apart from God. He died by the grace of God. Okay. So um, Bart makes the the case that this was a deliberate change. And in a sense, those are perhaps the most worrying, uh, Peter, because when we don't like to think that the Bible kind of people were, were... adding their own sort of versions of it uh, over time and making deliberate changes to, to to theology. You know, we would like to think that if we've got anything right in the Bible, it's the theology that springs from it. I mean, what what's your take on this passage? Well, uh, just to, to back up and talk about the concept of deliberate change as a whole, I mean, this is something that in uh, Bart's book he's using consistently or regularly as an explanation that scribes are deliberately changing. Now, I think scribes from time to time um, did uh, make uh, deliberate changes, but when someone copies a manuscript, the overwhelming number of mistakes they make are purely accidental. And so when I look at this particular variant in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, and I see one Greek word of five letters, one of six letters, and they share three letters, I think I don't immediately jump to an intelligent design explanation. Um, I think that we need to allow um, various chance processes of copying uh, to be given their, their full weight. Of course, the reading that um, uh, Bart uh, chooses as original, uh, namely apart from God, is theologically acceptable. It, 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 could, it could fit with the uh, book. Um, uh, I would say that at the moment, its a manuscript attestation is, is pretty weak. We're dealing with two 10th century manuscripts, although one of them is copied from something far, far earlier. Um, so it's significant, but still weak um, compared with uh, the attestation of the other reading. Uh, so, so you would you would support the 
the one that is is in the Bible as the primary reading. Oh, based based on the current evidence, that that would uh, be my sense. But uh, I wouldn't object um, uh, uh, to the other reading. Uh, but whichever way change has taken place, I don't see that it has to be deliberate. I, I think too many of these uh, changes that are being said to be deliberate uh, happen with similar looking words and things like that. Uh, and, and so I would want to be cautious about saying uh, that scribes are deliberately using um, uh, making changes. I mean, if there is some, you know, possibility that the wording may be different, that, that uh, Bart's right and what should really be in our Bible um, in terms of the original manuscript is apart from God. I mean, does that present a problem in, in as much as there may have been many sermons preached on this one verse, you know, and, and turning on the fact that this was from the, by the grace of God? Now, does that make that sermon defunct if, if, in fact, the original did read apart from God? I mean, that's the kind of questions that might spring to a preacher's mind. Well, well, next time I do this passage, should, which one should I be preaching on, you know? Well, I think there have been many, many good sermons preached from the wrong text. <laughs> so there, there are all sorts of, of, of just uh, things through history where people have, have taken what sometimes is called the right doctrine from the wrong text and that doesn't mean that uh, it was uh, in no way a valid exercise um, uh, but uh, obviously I, I think uh, people should take the right doctrine from the right text. Mm. And as far as you're concerned you're happy enough that, that we do have the right reading of it in our Bible for, to, for you to be able to pr preach a sermon on that and, and be satisfied that, that this is the correct... Uh, the... Yes and I, I think when, when I'm preaching, I um, focus on what I'm most certain about. So if I'm uh, less certain, let's say, about the meaning of a word, I don't make that the, um, the main focus. Now, some people have a view of the Bible in which it's essentially a magic book. And the thing about a magic spell is if you get one word wrong, none of it works whatsoever. Mm. Or as if it's clinically... Um, uh, sterile, and if there's one bit of defilement, then it doesn't work. Whereas, in fact, the way people have um, viewed the Bible historically is that uh, it's effective in translation, uh, even if uh, there are errors in that translation, even if you only have one book out of 66, um, that book is st still able to be effective. So it's much more like a radioisotope. Um, the Word of God, uh, even in uh, low dilution, can be thoroughly effective. I mean, you'd probably want to come back on, you know, your particular view of why you don't believe this is just a, a copying error. Um, you, you do believe it's deliberate, Bart. I mean, you feel that the evidence is strong enough. In, well, I think to... it's uh, the thing about a, a deliberate or an intentional change is that it's it's at the end of the day, impossible to demonstrate because we don't have the scribes around mm. to ask, did you mean to change this or, or were you just too tired and made a mistake? The, the interesting thing is, though, that whether it's an intentional change or an accidental change, it, it changes the intent of the passage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the passage means something different, whether it's an accident or not. And for me, that's the key difference. Yeah, but, but at the same time, you wouldn't say that the book in some ways suggesting that the, the fundamental doctrines of Christianity in some way called into question by textual variation. I mean, are, are I, you I making don't, that I, case? No, I don't, I don't argue that. I, I do argue that, that there are variants that do affect fundamental doctrines of Christianity, but I don't argue I – don't, I don't think that um, if you have a theologian who holds to a particular theological view, that you, if you give him a different manuscript – uh, and he reads that one instead of the one he was – that he's going to change his doctrine. Uh, people seem to have doctrines for all sorts of reasons, and they rarely have anything to do with uh, small textual variation. OK. So so you believe in a sense that there are uh, it, do, passages which are affected depending on the way um, you look at them, whether they support doctrine. But, but overall – there's, well, there's me, nothing there that's going to kind of be big enough to change a whole sort well, of I think trajectory of doctrine. not really. I mean, you know, I mean, just as an example of something that's fairly big. I mean, there, there's only one passage in the entire New Testament that explicitly teaches the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, it's in First John chapter five, uh, and it's it's um, a passage that says explicitly that there there are three beings: the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. Uh, so you have three divine beings; they are one. This is the only passage that explicitly 
uh, talks about the Trinity, and it wasn't originally in the New Testament. And most modern translations don't have it in. Exactly, or they put it in brackets and say it wasn't mm. originally there. But theologians are going to continue believing in the Trinity, whatever you do with a specific verse, because they have other reasons for believing in the Trinity. Mm. So my view is that these differences are important, but they're not important because they're going to revolutionize Christian theology. They're important because if the Bible's important, then the meaning of the Bible is important, and there are entire passages, indeed entire books, whose meanings get changed depending on which textual variant you accept. You're listening to Unbelievable, uh, an edition of the program with Bart Ehrman, who is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, he's author of many books, but his uh, most famous is certainly Misquoting Jesus, recently published in the UK as Whose Word Is It? That's the book we've been discussing on the program today. Uh, Peter Williams has been our Christian in the studio as the warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge. If you'd like to uh, respond to anything you've heard in the program, do email unbelievable at premier.org. UK. I'd love to hear back from you. And don't forget, we're online at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. You can uh, email that uh, link to someone else if they'd like to listen back to this program. They can do that via the web page or via the podcast. Uh, it's all possible. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Peter, having heard these things that Bart's been saying about no one's going to fundamentally change their view of Christian doctrine, but there are passages, at least, that are called into question. Um, I mean, do do you feel like uh, Bart's book is dangerous in any way to Christian faith, to, to belief, to, to the things that Christians hold dear? Uh, is it an attack in that sense or on that? Well, it, it may or may not be intended um, as an attack. I, I think... Uh, a lot of people will feel it um, a as such. Uh, what I'd say is, at least I feel it's rhetorically imbalanced and uh, misleading, um, so that uh, just just the very title, misquoting Jesus, and then the story behind who changed the Bible and why as the subtitle, and, and, and the way things are set up makes it highlight um, change and instability when actually you get down to what exactly uh, Bart is proposing, he's proposing uh, uh, what a New Testament that might be different in five or so verses from the recommended text of any modern English Bible translation. It's less different from uh, what you have in a modern English Bible translation from uh, the King James. So it's not actually as radical a proposal uh, as it looks at, at first sight. Uh, even even then, I, I think uh, that um, some of the proposals it makes, particularly in regard to uh, saying that scribes deliberately change the scriptures, are um, overplayed. So I, I think uh, things are in a in a better state. I don't think um, that any of the original uh, wording of the New Testament uh, can be shown to have been lost. Uh, so uh, where there's change, it's it's really you're talking about not knowing which coin, some, uh, which hand someone's holding a coin in mm. um, uh, between a couple of variants rather than uh, that coin having been lost. OK, so, so you feel, as you stated at the far start of the programme, for you, the, the glass is half full. Um, you see that your, your background of research into the historical aspects of the, the New Testament documents quite apart from where it took Bart, it has led you to feel the Bible is a very reliable document. On yeah, the whole. Yes, uh, in, in, in one sense, uh, I'd say that the cup's full and running over because even if we didn't have uh, the uh, Bible in Greek at all, the New Testament in Greek at all, I think you would still have um, a lot of access uh, to God's uh, communication. In fact, that's what most Christians experience because they don't read uh, the Bible, it's in original languages, and it still is communicating uh, because a uh, fundamental uh, belief uh, that Christians have had through time has been the effect in, effectiveness of Bible in translation. And so from the second century onwards, people began translating um, uh, parts of the New Testament. That was something, of course, they continued from uh, Jews who'd been translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek before then, uh, that it works in translation. I mean, what caused you to lose your faith in the authority and inerrancy of the Bible, Bart, was the idea that, well, even if God had inspired the original words, they haven't been passed down accurately 
and, and, and to some extent, Peter, and you can agree, at least in some instances in which that is true. Uh, and, and so for you, it, it, it kind of makes a nonsense of the idea that the Bible was originally uh, in, inerrant in its in the way it was written, because we don't have the original words. Uh, yeah, that certainly contributed to my change of views. Uh, I think what really uh, did my views in was recognizing not just that there are variations among the manuscripts, but that even when you can establish what was probably the original text, the New Testament is chock full of discrepancies and contradictions and, and altern- alternate points of view. But let me respond directly to Pete about uh, about what we've been talking as he thinks that I, I rhetorically uh, exaggerate the problem. In in our time together here, we've only talked about four four textual variants. If that. Yeah. If, but they're, they are significant issues. Did Jesus get angry at a, at a leper who wanted to be healed? Did you, Depends which manuscript you read. Did, did he die apart from God? Depends which manuscript. Does the New Testament specifically refer to the doctrine of the Trinity? Depends which manuscript you read. Did Jesus uh, confront this woman taken in adultery? Depends which manuscript. These are, these are significant issues issues, and we've only talked about four. Uh, there are hundreds of changes that we could have talked about today, uh, and they they really do matter. So for me, the question, I think, ultimately is this. How can the text of the Bible be authoritative if we can't agree on what the text was? If we don't even know what the text is, how do we know that it's authority? Or why should we say it's authoritative? Or what do, what do we even mean to say it's authoritative? Uh, if, if two well-trained scholars can't even agree on what the text is, well, which text is authoritative? Then? I, my view is that you can't say what the words mean if you don't know what the words were. And we, we don't seem to be able to agree on what the words were. Okay. Well, well going back, I mean, obviously we've heard, Peter, that for you, it's only a, a very small number of instances in which there there is an argument to be had. But but given that there are instances, and we've spoken about some of them today, um, what does it mean then to say that this is the authoritative word of God? Well, firstly, if I can uh, just uh, make a little correction, I, I wasn't saying that the number of instances in which uh, people cannot identify the earliest reading um, is small. Um, uh, there are a, a significant number of uh, those sorts of uh, uh, variants. Although what you're talking about most of the time is identifying which hand a coin is in mm. rather than uh, there is no certainty at all. And I think that all of the um, original wording uh, could be in the manuscripts that survive. So um, that's, a scholarly, that's a defensible position from a scholarly um, uh, viewpoint. Now, what I'd say is when we talk about a doctrine of scripture, it's important to understand what a doctrine of scripture should be if scholars can't agree what the reading is therefore the doctrine of scripture can't be held well uh, funnily enough the foundation for a christian doctrine of scripture is not scholarly agreement (laughs) Um, now obviously scholarship is hugely important uh, but scripture could be certain without humans being certain about it because actually um, the important thing with Scripture um, is uh, is not what humans think, but what God thinks. So when we understand how a uh, um, doctrine of Scripture is properly formulated, my personal level of certainty about something is not the foundation for a Christian doctrine of Scripture. Um, now, at, at the same time, uh, I, th- I think when we when we look at the evidence, we can see every reason to believe that God has effectively uh, communicated uh, to people through his word, both as um, it's been available in its original languages for uh, some of the history of the church in some parts of the church and as it's not been available. Um, so when you read the Old Testament, you read the story about Josiah finding the book of the law. There was a time when uh, scripture was not available and then it became available. Uh, so what we mustn't do is is build a doctrine of scripture on some uh, false idea of the availability of scripture to me or the identifiability of every aspect of uh, scripture. That's not the way uh, the doctrine is is uh, properly conceived. Okay. Well, it's it's been a fascinating discussion, and uh, obviously two very different points of view represented here 
in the studio. Um, and if you want to get hold of Bart's book, uh, it's available. Uh, you can get to it via the Premier Shop, uh, premier.org.uk forward slash shopping, and then use the uh, the Amazon uh, search tool to, to, to locate it. Uh, you can find it either in its uh, American edition as Misquoting Jesus or published in the UK as Whose Word Is It by Continuum. And uh, there's also a variety of literature that's emerging um, in response to Bart. Uh, let me just say about that and, and the correct doctrine of Scripture that my book isn't questioning at all whether God is true or not. The question is whether Scripture can give us the Bible, the New Testament, can give us access to this truth of God. And my question is, how can it do so if we don't know what words were in the Scripture? And the reality is uh, there are places where we don't know what the Scripture, what the New Testament books originally said. So if we don't know what they said, how can they be authoritative? That uh, strikes me as a pressing question, one that eventually led me away from my beliefs and the inspiration of the Scripture into uh, viewing the Bible as a as, uh, as still a, a terrifically important and valuable book, but not as delivering the words of God. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion between you both, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with me on the programme today. If you do want to uh, listen back, go to premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. And why not uh, pass this on to anyone else you know who may be interested? Uh, you can access the programme there. You can also subscribe to the podcast and you'll never miss an episode. Do join me again at the same time next week. You're unbelievable. When between uh, 2.30 and 4 o'clock, Bart joins me again, uh, looking at a completely different issue, but still very much focused in on the Bible, uh, God's problem, uh, how the Bible fails to answer our most important question, why we suffer. That's the title of Bart's latest book. He's going to be joining me along with Richard Swinburne as we look at this taxing issue and whether the Bible can give us any uh, understanding of why God, a loving, all-powerful God, would allow suffering and uh, whether there are any philosophical answers as well. Do join me again at the same time next week here on Unbelievable. Unbelievable.